Hi, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Kylie, just another army vet. I make military content. Today, I'm reacting to another Beer Biceps podcast. It's called Russia vs. Ukraine Explained Simply by Abhijit Shadra, History, Truth, and Future. This will be good to get an Indian perspective on what's going on in Ukraine, plus an unbiased history about the conflict as well. So let's get to it. Hey guys, this is a very special episode of the Runway Show. We'll be addressing the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Is World War III around the corner? What's the history of this entire crisis? What are the geopolitical angles? What's India's role in this entire crisis? For some reason, I feel like Indian media hasn't reported this scenario as much as it should. And who better than Abhijit Chavda to kind of give us a commentary on whatever is happening. How much news coverage is the Indian media giving to this crisis now that Russia has invaded Ukraine? Is it headline news every day? Because that's what's going on in the U.S. right now. Enjoy. Abhijit Chavda, sir, welcome to the Ranvi Show again for the first time. We're doing it remote. Russia and Ukraine, sir. I feel it's not as reported in India as it should be. Uh, what's your take on it? What are you making of this whole situation? Well, it's a very interesting situation right now. Very complex, very fast moving situation. What we are seeing right now as, as of today, uh, the February, end, end of February, what we are seeing is that the geopolitical analysts and observers and forecasters, the past 48 hours, they would not have slept much because so much is happening. So many events have happened just uh, very recently and things are moving very fast. So what we have seen is that President Putin of Russia has recently uh, announced that his nation is going to recognize the independence of two breakaway republics, uh, which are part of Ukraine, which is uh, uh, the, the, two, uh, the two republics, which is uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. So those two have been uh, declared independent and Russia has now recognized that. So that is tantamount to, in a way, annexation of some parts of Ukrainian territory. Of course, there is more that Russia is eyeing and they have given a number of historical and other reasons for to justify their claims on this territory. So that's what's happening right now. The NATO, the Americans are pushing back. They are very unhappy about it, but there's nothing it looks like that they can do right now to stop this from happening. They don't want to see a war. Nobody wants a war. Wars are dangerous. They are destructive. So the Russians essentially have, have achieved something, a significant, not small territorial gain without resorting to war. They have been saber rattling and all that. And they used the, the, a certain timing. The uh, Winter Olympics were happening in Beijing, in China, and uh, the entire world's attention was focused there. At that time, they started this pressure point on Eastern Europe. The Chinese were also uh, uh, imparting some pressure on Taiwan. We know they have been escalating their incursions the past few months. So it looks like there has been this coordinated effort, a double pincer movement, a two front war threat, the kind of uh, threat that we in India face all the time. So the same sort China of thing has been uh, uh, orchestrated by these two countries in cooperation with, with each other. And right now we are seeing that uh, parts of Ukraine are now uh, going into essentially de facto Russian control. So, so one thing that came up in my research for this episode was the very, very complex history of domestic politics that are happening in that region. Now, in order for people to understand what's happening in Ukraine now, how far back do you really have to go? Because according to me, you have to go really, really far back. But, uh, sir, you're the historian, so I'll let you kind of uh, begin the story in your own way. So I think to understand the roots of this conflict, etc., I think we may need to go back a thousand years. Thousand and years. I can make it fast. I, will, I I don't want to go into great detail. We need to concentrate what's happening right now. But to understand the history of why this conflict happens, we have to go back to the roots of the Russian people. So the, the Russian people are, well, I'll, actually, I think I should go back 2,000 years and make it very brief. So the, the Russian peoples are a Slavic people. Now, the first uh, uh, historical attested uh, record of the Slavic people is in Roman records in the first or second century AD. And they have always been uh, settled in parts of Eastern Europe, more or less. And uh, they were an Indo-European people. They used to worship the thunder god, the rain god, Parjanya, Perun, they used to call him, and so on. Now, uh, so they settled in parts of Eastern Europe. Then there was this, uh, this is constant migration that happens. The Huns came from the East and all. So they were, the, the Slavs were, were uh, forced to move westwards and on. Then what you had is that, uh, there were these Vikings, you know, the Vikings, those warriors from Scandinavia, 
so they kind of took over the leadership of the slavic peoples just briefly they were called the varangians their leader was called uh, what was his name prince oleg i think prince oleg and his father was rurik the 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 uh, leader of the kievan rus so the rus the name of the russians it comes from these varangians these uh, vikings who called themselves rus and they became the leaders and that's how they mm. uh, they the slavic peoples of present day russia their ancestors came to be called rus and they were in present day uh, present day ukraine muscovy etc all that and then for some time what you had is that uh, the russians were under the mongols after the expansion of chinggis khan the mongols took over russia and for quite some time a couple of centuries at least they were under mongol rule then again they became independent now this territory called ukraine it has been settled by scythians alans huns bulgars mongols tatars all these people in the 14th century what is now ukraine was called little russia now in the 17th and 18th century russians serbs greeks etc settled there and they called this region novorossiya which means new russia and uh, later it came to be known is ukrania or ukrania which means the russian borderland all right so it's always been a russian territory this is history there is nothing controversial about this it's always been russian territory now the ukrainian language it emerged out of this region at some time it is just another slavic language you can consider it to be a dialect of russian in some way it's very similar and so on sounds the same and uh, it's more or less the same right so that so that is the uh, history going back a few centuries and now uh, after the 1917 russian revolution uh this uh, the the bolsheviks came to power lenin stalin all these people trotsky and so on uh, trotsky was, was taken care of earlier that doesn't matter so the ussr started taking shape at that time socialism communism all that these various uh, so called soviet republics were organized in in a variety of ways just for administrative purposes so a lot of russian territory was given over to what is now called ukraine Ukraine was an administrative division within the USSR and the constitution of the USSR was such that technically each Soviet socialist republic within the USSR was like a nation on its own technically and they had the right technically to secede but under somebody like Stalin even the dream of seceding out of the USSR could not occur so it was a very uh, centralized state the USSR now what Stalin did was he added some russian territory to the Uh, present uh, to to ukraine for administrative purposes after the second world war it was i think khrushchev who added crimea which is a russian territory to ukraine for administrative purposes and the situation went on until uh, the dissolution of the ussr so what happened is that earlier you had very powerful leaders like stalin and so on later on as is as is the story with every empire every great uh, state you have weaker leadership and so cracks begin to be visible so uh, so what happened is that the subsequent soviet leadership was not very good at managing the economy the nation became decrepit and so on in the 1980s cracks began to be very visible the economy was in a shambles the west was doing very well and so on and then mikhail gorbachev comes into the picture uh, if you look at uh, the way they regard him even today in russia it's not very uh, very nice they don't they, they don't think very highly of mikhail gorbachev because he presided over the destruction of the ussr Uh, he is in some corners uh, even alleged to be a western agent so what happened Ooh. is that in 1989 91 in that period the ussr is that really a theory that he was a western agent drop that in the comments that's a very interesting point he just made integrated and the leadership was so weak that all these republics declared independence one of them was ukraine ukraine became independent and the deal was that whatever foreign debt external debt the ussr owed to other countries russia would take care of that but in exchange for that all these breakaway republics they would hand over all the ussr national assets to russia including nuclear weapons i think since then ukraine has acquired nuclear weapons i may be wrong though but i think they have some so that's the, that was the deal and ukraine became one of these uh, independent republics independent nations they handed over the uh, nuclear warheads weapons etc and they kept on uh, getting a uh, lots of uh, aid subsidies from the from from russia so it's about in the last 20 years or so they've got about 250 billion dollars of of uh, subsidized aid from the uss uh, from the russians and so on so that is the situation so until 2013 uh, you had Voldo, volodymyr zelensky who was the president in ukraine 
Now in 2013, 2014... That Zelensky came into power in the last few years or so. ...and revolution that happened in Ukraine. Is that the elected president... Uh, I'm sorry, it was not Volodymyr Zelensky, it was Viktor Yankovych who was okay. the president. Sorry, sorry, that's a correction. So this guy, who was the elected president, he was deposed. He was forcibly removed. He was ousted in this revolution. And a pro-EU, pro-NATO government was installed by early 2014, by February 2014. So this is essentially a pro-NATO regime change. It's essentially a coup. Vladimir Putin sees this as a coup. And a former actor and comedian, Zelensky, became the president of Ukraine. So this happened sometime in uh, February 2014. And immediately, by the end of February 2014, what you see is that there is this emergence of pro-Russian unrest in Ukraine, especially in the east and the south parts of Ukraine, which have lots of people, a majority that are Russian speaking, and they identify themselves as Russians, the population. And even if you look at the whole of Ukraine today, what you find is that there are lots of Russian speaking people, people who consider themselves to be ethnic Russians, not Ukrainians. And the funny thing, the curious thing is that Ukraine has not held a census for more than 20 years for some reason, because then these, these demographics will, will become very apparent. Right. So these are just facts. Okay. I'm not uh, taking this side or that side. I'm just telling you what uh, the way I see it, the way I read it. So what you have in 2014, February onwards, is there is unrest, right? There is uh, this resistance towards what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, so in March 2014, Crimea was annexed by Mr. Putin. Like I said, was traditionally a Russian uh, territory. And then there is this war in this region. It's called the Donbass region, which is East and South Ukraine. So in uh, 2014 itself, two independent republics were proclaimed, the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic. So this is the uh, the Eastern part of, of Ukraine and the Southern part of Ukraine, right? Southeast uh, and so on. So that's what happened. So these two republics declared their independence. Obviously they were aided and abetted by the, by the Russians, right? Uh, then you had a referendum that happened, that happened in 2014 itself, Donbass status referendum, which sought to legitimize the establishment of these two republics, right? And then then you had all this fighting that was happening between the pro-Russian militia and the Ukrainian forces. Some terrible things happened in 2014. This Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down. They thought it was something mm -hmm. else and it was a horrible mm -hmm. thing which happened. Uh, so that was a ter terrible tragedy that happened at this time. Then in September 2014, there was the first Minsk agreement between the warring sides, between the Russians, the Ukrainians and some other mediators. It was a 12-point peace plan in September 2014. Within a couple of months, it was totally like it collapsed. By, by early 2015, the whole thing collapsed because in November 2014, you had the general elections that were held in the Donbass region, which elected the chief executives and the parliaments of this region. And by early 2015, by January, February, this protocol, this agreement collapsed. Then in February, they started the whole thing again. Then you had the Minsk II protocol, Minsk II agreement, which is, I believe, a 13-point agreement, which was signed. And it has never been implemented because the last two points about special status that should be given to Donbass, it is interpreted in different ways by both the sides. So there's never been agreement on that. And there's been this conflict which is going on. It has never become a hot war, but there is this insurgency, this uh, conflict, artillery, fighting, shooting, all that that's been going on since 2015, since February and so on. Now what happened is in 2021, there was an escalation of this fighting. And that's continued until right now, until 2022. And of late, there's been this big Russian military buildup on the Ukrainian border, on the eastern part of Ukraine. And what's also interesting is in December 2021, December last year, uh, the president of Belarus essentially told Russia that he was willing to uh, accommodate nuclear weapons again on, on Belarusian territory. And the in December, the I, I think it's in December, the constitution of Belarus was very subtly amended, which essentially says that Belarus is no longer bound by, new, by, by the principle of neutrality and all that. So what you can interpret this to be is that Belarus is now technically or de facto annexed by Russia. Yeah, Russia and Belarus are like best buddies. Belarus is no longer independent in, in the truest sense of the, of the world. It is now essentially part of the Russian orbit. So Belarus is now Russian, Crimea is Russian, uh, Donbass is Russian, and the Russians are eyeing more territory. And they have justified it with 
proper historical precedent, precedent. Mr. Putin last night gave a long speech, nearly one hour speech, in which he laid out the entire uh, history of what happened. He blamed Vladimir Lenin for the way the, the constitution was created and the way the powers were given to all the USSR republics, which in, in a sense is correct, what he said. So when did Lenin or whoever write that constitution for Russia? In Ukraine, we had this weak government that was installed by the American-led NATO, which was a weak government. Wherever you don't have sufficient power, there's a power vacuum. And power is, is an expansionist force. It's like, it's like pressure. So where there is a power vacuum, some other power will come and take over. So that's what's happening in Russia. The Russians uh, always have, for the past 20 years, they have, they have uh, lamented the fact that their great USSR broke up and that the fact that the NATO uh, has been able to take various uh, Russian orbit states into their orbit. And I think there was an agreement that was uh, signed or it was agreed upon between Russia and NATO that Ukraine, Belarus, etc., would never be incorporated into NATO. And now that agreement was on the verge of being broken. And that's why this all this is happening. And there's also a China angle because we are witnessing the uh, the systemic coordination of activities now between Russia and China. So, see, as we know, Russia is no longer a great power from the economic perspective. They are not no longer even in the top 10 economies in the world. But they are a military superpower. They have the largest nuclear weapons arsenal. Especially now, they're not an economic superpower because of all the sanctions that are being put on them. They also have an enormous military strength, which is the legacy of the USSR, which, as we know, was a, was a real superpower. So although you, the, the Russians may not be an economic superpower, they are a genuine military superpower. Yes. And the Chinese are willing to bankroll them. Right. The Chinese need an attack dog in Europe. Well, I would not use, like to use the word dog, but you know what I mean? So they are using Russia essentially as their enforcers in, in Europe. And so these two nations, I would not call it an alliance, but there is certainly a, co a, a, a sort of cooperation and coordination that's happening right now. And this is why India has to look out for India and stay neutral on this whole thing. They don't want to piss off Russia because if Russia and China get too buddy-buddy, then that would be very bad for India. So from Mr. Putin's perspective, this is a short to medium term game, the coordination with China. Because if you look at the history of China and Russia, there is a very complex and interesting history right there also. In the 1960s, the USSR nearly, nearly nuked China. And they were prevented from, by, from doing so by the US. And that is where the rise of China begins because the Americans brought China into their orbit. So it's a very complex history. But China and Russia had a very terrible land dispute, the kind of land dispute we, uh, India and China have today. There was fighting. There was the Usuri River clashes in the 1960s. Lots of people died in that, so soldiers from both sides. The Russians prevailed. Later on, there was a boundary demarcation agreement. But the Russians, they regard that uh, border dispute as not closed, but dormant. The Chinese mm -hmm. will reopen it at the appropriate time. So China and Russia are not natural allies. They are natural adversaries. But right now, for the time being, because their national interests align for the moment, they are cooperating. We understand that uh, China's interests right now are to be that global superpower because they are already the economic superpower in the world. So when it comes to Russia in this whole situation, is it money as the underlying force? Is it their own historical pride as the underlying force? Is it uh, geographical expansion which will then lead to say money or say power? Like what is the actual underlying reason they're doing this anyway? So there's a multiple multiplicity of reasons for this. First of all, there is the historical grievance that uh, the territory that has been historically Russian has been taken away from the Russians because of the weak leadership of the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s. So all this territory that was historically Russian territory was given away. Lots of Russian pe speaking people, lots of uh, ethnic Russians are stranded in other so-called other countries right now. So Mr. Putin seeks to reunify that. Mr. Putin, I would uh, imagine, has a big ego for a man who commands such a large country. So I think what he said, what the, the speech that he gave yesterday, he was laying out his vision and plans for Akhand Russia. That's essentially what he is seeking, <laughs> right? So that is one thing. Secondly, the Russians seek to rise again. They were super. They were a superpower. Today, they have been destroyed in, a, in the economic sense. Mr. Yeltsin systematically destroyed the Russian economy. It was done on purpose. 
Right. So Mr. Putin has uh, stopped the bleeding first of all, and then he has revived Russia to a certain extent. And purpose. But Russia is still economically weak. But they are econo- they are militarily powerful. So that's where this relationship with China comes in. China is flush with money. China, as you say, it seeks to become a global superpower. Right now, it is the world's second largest economy. I would not consider China to be a superpower. The definition of a super- superpower is that a, it's a country that controls the global systems, the financial system, the economic system, the institutions, and also it has the ability to intervene militarily anywhere in the world at 60 minutes notice. So that's a superpower. The Chinese don't control the global systems. They don't, the global currency is still the US dollar. dollar. The IMF, the, w, the World Bank are all still con- uh, controlled by the US. I remember my trip to Vietnam and the Vietnamese wanted us to use our American dollars. I don't even remember what their currency was, but it was rare to see the Vietnamese currency. They wanted all the US dollars. So that was back in 2001. Even the UN, to some extent, is still controlled by the US. The Chinese have infiltrated it a lot, UN, WHO, UNESCO, etc. So they are doing it. They're, they're trying their best. They, they aim to replace the US and displace them by maybe 2050. That is the great hope that they have. That is the great Chinese dream. That is the dream of Mr. Xi Jinping. So he will use everything at his disposal to achieve this, including a a temporary relationship with Russia. When the time is right, he will not want Russia to rise too much, obviously, because that becomes a huge threat for him. They have a long common border. So that right now we are seeing a tripartite. Actually, we are seeing a slow bipolarization of the world. So Mm. typically, your geopolitical commentators will say that we are seeing a multipolar world right now. That is a transient phase. This the 2020s are a decade of great and very rapid change. So we are very rapidly seeing this bipolarization of the world. On the one hand, we have the dragon bear, which is Russia and China. On the other hand, we have the US led global system in which India is still in, in to a large extent a part of it, the quad and all those things. But we are also quite close to Russia. We are not close to China, of course, but we are part of, part of the Shang, Shanghai Agreement, uh, Shanghai Cooperation, SCO organization, the BRICS also. So India is kind of uh, somewhere in between. Our, our great threat is China. Our great ancient old relationship is with Russia. Our emerging relationship is with the Americans and uh, everybody else. So India is kind of caught in the middle, but I think India is playing an interesting game right now. Because if you see, uh, yesterday, the, the, the entire thing was announced by Mr. Putin. Then the United, uh, United Nations Security Council, it held, it held a meeting and many nations condemned this. India refused to condemn the Russian actions. India said that the, all parties should ensure there is no violence and try to resolve this amicably, peaceably with uh, negotiations and talks and all that. That sort of statement was made by India. And you see this outpouring on Twitter of all the think tank experts. People are mad. Disposable freelance... Uh, minions of the US State Department who are pouring, pouring scorn on India, but India is not sticking to principles. Are by what principles? What principles is India supposed to stick to? India is supposed to stick to look out for India principle. Principles in geopolitics is your self-interest. My, self, my national interest is paramount. That's the only principle I'm going to follow. When the, when the Pakistanis were bleeding India, slice by slice by slice. Watch him go after the US now. I, I bet that's what he says. Let's see. Did the Americans impose sanctions on the, on, the, on the Pakistanis? No, they funded the Pakistanis. It was American money that was used to bleed India. The Americans used Pakistan as a proxy to bleed India for decades, right? When the Chinese, uh, when the 2008 Mumbai attacks happened, did they condemn Pakistan? Did they take the name of Pakistan and condemn Pakistan? No, they did not. Did they impose sanctions on Pakistan? Nothing. When the Chinese did the Dolat Beg Oldi incident, the Galwan incident, they killed Indian soldiers, did the world condemn that? Was any sanctions uh, passed on, on China? Nothing. So why does India need to take their side when, when the same thing is happening over there? India should adopt the same policy of staying neutral. This is not our fight. I don't have a horse in this race. You guys take care of it. We will urge peace and calm and negotiations. Don't fight. That's all we should say. So that's the stand India is taking and the West especially is very, very upset with that, especially the US. So that's where we are right now. Hmm. That's true. Uh, Would love for you to shed some light on the US's interest in this whole game. Is it purely the fact that the dragon bear is getting more powerful? Is there even deeper interest? 
So the US, uh, the last 30 years, has been the sole superpower after the collapse of the USSR, which one could say that they engineered, right? So they won. They won the Cold War, and everybody thought, yeah, now all the world will be peaceful, everything will be fine, all the problems will go away. No problem ever went away. Now the Chinese are rising. They seek to displace and replace the US. So for, so for the Americans, it is a mortal threat. The US has a very simple doctrine. It's called the Blitzer Doctrine. It's a very very uh, obscure and less known doctrine. And the doctrine says that any nation, if it rises above a certain threshold, it has to be destroyed. Don't allow any nation to even think of becoming a threat or a competitor to the US. So you see this, the entire history of the 20th and 21st century, all the numerous interventions the Americans have done in various places, it's, you can see this in action and in motion. So the entire Middle East crisis, which has been going on for, for decades, they have kept it going, they have kept it churning and so on. Now, so they, seek, they, they see the Chinese as a big mortal threat. And in the last 20 years, after the rise of Mr. Putin, even the, even the Russians have risen again, and they are also a challenge to the US. Because the US, it wants the whole of Europe to come under their orbit. Inclu so everything should be a part of NATO, including yeah, yeah. Ukraine, including all these former Soviet republics. And the Russians see that as a huge challenge. They will not allow it. It is a red line that they will not allow the N Americans on, and NATO to cross. So it's a, it's a tussle. The Americans seek global hegemony. There should be no competitor, no rival at all. We want a unipolar world. That's what the Americans have always sought. But in the last 20, 30 years, they messed it up. Because if you look at the U.S. today, it is a deeply divided nation. Uh, there is no leadership today in the U.S. I, I hate to say this. I hate to say, say it openly. But if you look at the last 10, 20 years, where's the leadership? People make fun of George W. Bush, but at least he did something, some action. He fed the military industrial complex monster. He did a war in uh, Iraq and all. So he took some kind of affirmative, positive action from the U.S. side. But after him, Mr. Obama has bombed civilians, bombed helpless people. He has given big speeches, but where's the leadership? Speeches and slogans don't make leaders. It's actions that make leaders. So the U.S. is suffering from a lack of leadership. Trump was in, power, was in office. He was never in power. He was a lame duck president for four years. The political class was shocked at his rise, and they never allowed him to do anything at all, to do anything substantial. So Obama did nothing. Trump was not allowed to do anything. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it how it is. And now you have, you know, who we, who we have. We have Mr. Biden. So, and, and uh, we also have Kamala, Mr. Biden and Kamala Harris. You call that leadership? There's no leadership. So the U.S. What is the majority opinion of the U.S. leadership now with President Biden and Kamala Harris? That's what I'm curious about. And to touch upon what he was saying, the U.S. is deeply divided and much of the country is not a fan of Biden and Kamala. And I'm not going to give my opinion out for the world. That's not going to happen on this platform. But a lot of Americans are not happy with him. And especially with this Ukraine thing going on, his approval rating is down to about 40%, which is the lowest it's ever been in his presidency, I believe. So, yeah. U.S. is deeply divided. It's a deeply, deeply divided nation. There, is, there are all these internal conflicts that are raging in the U.S. The uh, race conflict is raging. The class conflict is raging. The rich versus poor divide is widening. It is horrific. You have homelessness rampant in the U.S. People are pooping on the streets. The U.S. LA. is declining. It's going backwards, backwards, backwards. It's like the decline of the Roman Empire that we are watching. But they still have this vast military machine and economic machine. So they are a declining culture, civilization. Uh, it's never been a civilization, sorry. It's, they are a declining, declining empire. But they still have the remnants of power. So they are fighting back against the dying of the light. That's what we are seeing. And they also have the entire uh, um, big data and all that. So they are using that to fight back against China. So what we are seeing is this clash right now. We could call it a clash of civilizations or a clash of two hegemons who both seek uh, primacy in the globe. So that's what we are seeing. The Americans want global hegemony, but now they are too weak to do that without allies. And that's why they are seeking an Indo-Pacific alliance. They are trying to create the Quad. They have the NATO, which is still there. And they are very deeply upset that India, even though it's part of the Quad, is not supporting them where NATO is concerned. 
and so on and so forth. So this is the the wrenching apart of the global order that we are we are witnessing. We are witnessing. I it looks like we are witnessing the end, the beginnings of the end of Pax Americana, the American hegemony in the world, and God knows where we are going to go. If if it continues this way, the Chinese will rise, and we will have Pax Sinica. The the Chinese will take over the world, which, in my opinion, is not going to be a great thing. So I, it's still too early to say, but it looks like the U.S. is declining. The Chinese, with the help of the Russians, are rising. India is somewhere in the middle. India is still a small country, small economy. Three billion is not big enough. It is still just a medium-sized economic power. Once India reaches the ten billion dollar, ten trillion dollar threshold, trillion, not billion. Trillion, okay. Reaches 10 trillion that makes more sense. Of GDP. That's when India will be a sizable power, and it will be able to make its uh, make its uh, opinions heard, and it's uh, it, it will be able to shape its neighborhood at least. So this is going to be a very very interesting decade. Anything could happen essentially. Mm. Will World War Three happen in this decade? That's a very interesting question. You know, nobody wants World War Three. Uh, see. If you look at the U.S., they have so many interests all across the globe. They have so many uh, systems they have put, they have put in place. They've got they've put supply chains in place. They've got so many alliances in place. So many investments in so many countries. If a war happens, they will lose all that. So they don't want that to happen. It's it's going to be a terrible financial and economic blow for them. Any kind of war. Similarly, for the Chinese, they have built up so much since the 1980s. They have like um, they have their economy has grown like. Multiple, multiple times, right? I mean, uh, in the 1990s, their economy was the same place as India's is today, three billion. Today, it is 17, 18 billion dollars, six times, right? So they have grown so much, they have built so much of their country. If there is a war, they stand to lose everything. So they don't want a war. The Americans don't want a war. The Russians don't want a war. We also don't want a war. We are a growing economy. We don't want uh, that to be disrupted. We already had three lost years, the, the pandemic. So nobody wants a war. Nobody wants World War III. And this is why NATO and the U.S. are treading carefully when it comes to what kind of aid they're actually giving Ukraine. They don't want to piss off a big bear to the point where he's going to start pulling out nukes or something. Today, in the 21st century, wars will be fought by other means. Cyber, wars. cyber warfare, you will have information warfare, you will have disinformation warfare, misinformation warfare, mm -hmm. social media warfare, propaganda, and very diplomatic warfare. Sanctions can be imposed on economies and destroy the economies like the Americans have done to Iran and so on, uh, Yemen, etc. So these are the means by which w countries would prefer to wage the wars. They don't want kinetic warfare, which causes destruction because everybody has a lot to lose, right? Nobody wants a war. So I don't see a large scale war, war erupting unless somebody messes up badly and miscalculates badly. So what we are seeing right now in the Donbas region is a very calculated move by Mr. Putin. He has been putting the pieces of the chessboard in motion in place since at least 2014, at least most likely a few years before that. So what he has done yesterday, he has been planning for a decade. This was the end goal, and this is still not the end goal. There is more to come. So, but it is done in a way that it doesn't cross anybody's red lines, anybody's thresholds, and there is no actual warfare, actual country versus country warfare. You have sub sub national warfare. You have these insurgencies and civil wars and all. That is okay. That will that will that will find nothing more than that. So there are certain thresholds that nobody wants to cross. So I personally hope there is no large scale war. I don't see it happening unless somebody miscalculates badly. People do miscalculate. It, it, if you if you look at the record of history, it's littered with it's littered with examples of miscalculations. So to put this podcast into perspective, this was released the day before the Russians invaded. I believe, if I'm remembering my dates correctly, at this point in the podcast, though, I'm not sure if he's talking about war in Ukraine or a World War Three. I mean, nobody wants war, but war is upon Ukraine and Russia right now. Which we have seen in the 20th century and we may even see now. One hopes it doesn't happen, but if Mr. Xi Jinping does some stupid misadventure, or if he is kicked out of power by the Soviet, uh, by, by the Chinese Communist Party's Politburo, if there's a coup, or if something goes wrong somewhere else, if the Americans miscalculate, there could be a war. Which is something we don't want because there are nuclear weapons on each side. Everybody has them now, so it's it would not be a good thing for the world. So I hope it doesn't happen. I think it's very unlikely to happen, 
but there's a small chance somebody could mess up why did you say that all the geopolitical observers are very kind of restless right now is it because every small move is being uh, observed and are you trying to predict what will happen going forward and uh, i mean the supplemental question here is did any of the geopolitical observers predict this move yes so they have been um, so we know that this build up this military build up by the by build up by the russians has been uh, has been increasing since late 2021 so it's been a number of months that this is happening and you could see something is going to happen because this kind of build up it will either lead to a war or some kind of big event so everybody was wondering when it will happen and some geopolitical observers had predicted it will happen at the end of the winter olympics which was 20th of february so until that time they will keep on building the pressure and uh, russia and, and the chinese don't want anything anything to go wrong before that once the olympics are over in beijing then something may happen and that's precisely what happened so that's why and and what happened yesterday is big moves it's not small incremental moves it's like uh, the, the the release of the big pressure like in a tectonic uh, zone you have these small earthquakes that keep happening and then there is a big earthquake that, that releases that releases all the pressure so that's the kind of thing that happened yesterday of course there could be more aftershocks coming in so that's why everybody is awake nobody is sleeping everybody is awake for the past 24 48 hours because uh, people are busy making predictions people are busy saying you know i was right i said this i said that and people are trying to predict what's going to happen in the next week next month next year that sort of thing so it's a, it's a time of feverish activity among this community the geopolitical think tank people and the observers and forecasters so some people did predict there is a lady called velina chakarova she actually tweeted this last year december or something that uh, until 20th of february there will be nothing but after that anything could happen and most likely some action will happen in the in the donbas region so she has been proven to be right so that's the kind of thing that's mm-hmm. going on right now it did happen there's unlimited questions in my head sir but i wanted to make this a crisp piece that's why i'll ask you one last question for today's conversation uh what is your prediction for the next year uh from a geopolitical perspective what's going to happen according to you uh apart from this what we have just witnessed i don't see any major geopolitical action happening in the next one year i think this decade is going to be very interesting lots of things may change even borders may change in this decade this year i think the big action has happened maybe there will be some more uh uh some more military action happening in ukraine maybe the two republics have already been kind of integrated in some way in under russia but the russians may expand further westwards into the other parts of donbas that are still held by the ukrainians so that could happen so you could see the the territory that's held by the ukrainians may be reduced by half there is a possibility so that could happen and you could see the further strengthening of the russia china relationship the dragon bear relationship you will see a lot of uh, push back coming against india from the west because india has remained neutral in this thing so they will be very unhappy about this you could also see a strengthening of the quad alignment in case china ta- makes some moves now because the chinese the chinese are desperate to take back taiwan i am not saying it will happen this year maybe it could if they feel their time is right Right now, China is watching closely the world's reaction to Russia invading Ukraine. Because if they want to eventually invade Taiwan, then they're going to expect the same thing. Hey, the world might impose some sanctions, but they're not going to do anything big to stop us. So, at least that's one school of thought. If the Chinese take over Taiwan, it's going to be game on in the Indian Ocean because their pressure point will be relieved over there. then they'll be able to send their ships into the indian ocean and s- start squeezing india and india has already thought of this because india is developing some very st- very frightful weapon systems to deal with exactly such an eventuality so we are uh, we are not just developing it we are already already testing these weapons these are mi- these are missile developed torpedoes that can take out ships from more than 1000 kilometers away ships and submarines also so that's the kind of weapon that india is developing because our navy navy is not that extensive right now but if a wow. foreign navy comes into our strategic backyard we can take them out with pinpoint accuracy with these new weapon systems so that's what india is doing so this year i don't see a lot of very substantial geopolitical developments happening but it's going to be substantial this decade for sure so i can't make any any concrete predictions because i can't think of anything that could certainly for sure happen but we are going into bipolarity 
we are already in the middle of, of we are already in the start of cold war 2.0 we are in cold war 2.0 and the world is going to be become further bipolarized so we're going to have one pole and another pole the chinese and the russians with all everybody who wants to be with them against the old order so india is kind of in the old order right now because right now it serves our interests the best to side with the us and the old order so that's where we are right now what will be the outcome of the west basically being pissed off with india because of this whole situation and india's neutral stance they will try and uh, impose some costs on india maybe they will use pakistan as a stick to beat india with some things could happen uh, right now there's not much they can do also because they need india in the indo pacific india controls the entire indian ocean region india dominates the indian ocean region india if if a conflict happens in the future india will have to be used as a staging base for any conflict with china because of the geographical region india is a very massive it's the only possible counterweight to china in asia so there's not much they can do against india also but uh, they, they are right now going uh, going after uh, dr s jay shankar on on social media and all that so that sort of thing is happening and all that but in the long run Who india will be a massive player in the quad and in any indo pacific alliance against china so i don't think a lot can be done against india by the west but they are quite pissed off for sure because we have stayed neutral and they deserve it they did not deserve mm. our support so obviously this man is very well educated and well read i think he answered all renbeer's questions very well because this is a military channel i'm not going to delve too deep into the politics of this podcast i do want to say that india right now is staying neutral because it's looking out for number one which is india if you do want to know my opinion about what's going on, then check out my Q&A video linked down below. And I have some other videos on the screen you may want to check out. Thanks for watching.